Hey there folks. The other day I was out doing some walleye fishing and I looked into a school of lake whitefish and I was able to bring several home. If you've never seen a whitefish, they're actually a member of the Salmonidae family. So they're really closely related to trout and salmon and they have very dense, firm and oily white uh, meat that's highly regarded in the Great Lakes for its taste. and today I thought I would do some canning. Now a long time ago I had caught a few whitefish um, and I also had a bunch of salmon I needed to process so I just threw a couple of jars of whitefish in the canner and uh, we also canned a lot of albacore at that time too and somehow the whitefish got mixed up in the albacore and Apparently we ate it without even noticing it and a lot of people will sometimes refer to lake whitefish as faux tuna So what I'm going to do on this video is I'm going to show you how to can lake whitefish um, I got about three and a half fish here. I'm going to do so it's going to be a pretty small batch I'm guessing I'll get about a half pound of meat per half pint jar That's what I'm going to use is these little half pints here and uh, I'm going to process it I'm not going to pre-smoke it or anything like that. I know that's really popular. A lot of folks like to smoke it first and then put it in the canner. But the only thing I'm going to do is just remove the skin, but I'm going to leave the pin bones in place. They will dissolve under the heat and pressure of the canner. But then what I'm going to do is later this week, I'm going to make a whitefish melt rather than a tuna melt. But I'm not going to tell my wife that it's whitefish. I'm going to tell her that it's tuna. And then I'm gonna see her reaction when she eats it. So um, this will she'll be my little guinea pig, and we'll see if it can be passed off for tuna, or if she notices something strange going on. So let's get processing on this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the skin off using a fillet knife, and uh, I you can put the the skin in there. Some folks leave the skin on. I find it adds a little bit of like a chalky texture to it and I just find it less appealing. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove the skin, but you can leave the pin bones in there. They're gonna dissolve, not a problem. So let's get started on that. All right, so to take the skin off, it's pretty easy. I'm just gonna use my knife here, run it down along the skin. There we go. They have really big scales um, that come off really easy, but as you can see, it's really beautiful fillet. It's very firm. So I'm going to go ahead and finish doing that for the rest of the whitefish I have. Okay, so next I'm going to start slicing these up uh, so that I can get them in the half pint jars. So you want to think about, you know, how big do you want to cut the pieces? You want to leave about an inch worth of head space at the top here. So just below this rim right here. And I already sterilized these um, using the high heat setting on my dishwasher. So I'm just gonna start cutting these up into chunks so that I can start stuffing them into the jars. Okay, time to start packing the jars. We do our best to keep the rims clean, but we're gonna go back through and uh, clean those anyways. That's kind of why I cut them at this, that particular height where it just comes in just below. So I can just kind of slide them all in there and create a well packed can jar. Try and take up as much space as we can gaps. I cut salmon and tuna in the same way. So there you go, you have it nice packed tight. You can see it looks good. Not many air bubbles. It's okay if a few scales are in there, they're gonna dissolve. So I ended up getting five jars, which is gonna be about two and a half pounds of meat from those three and a half fish. Uh, we had the other one fresh uh, yesterday, the other half of one of those fish. Uh, normally I wouldn't do batches so small, but this is just a, a way to show you guys and also test this this purported tuna 
faux tuna taste on them. So next I'm going to go ahead and put just a pinch of kosher salt in each of the cans. Next, a little trick I use to make sure that they seal well is I take some vinegar and paper towel and I just soak the paper towel in a little bit of vinegar. And then I use that vinegar soaked paper towel to wipe the edges of the jar. And that seems to help get improved sealing. Next, I'm gonna put the lids on. These are wide mouths, and then put the screw top lids on. You want to go pretty, pretty tight on these, pretty firm, um, so that you get a good seal and you don't get a bunch of water penetration inside the jar. All right, next we're gonna go ahead and put our five jars here down inside the pressure canner. Then I'm gonna add two and a half quarts of water. You have to pressure can these for a long time so you need to have plenty of water so you don't run out of steam and burn everything inside there and cause your jars to break. And I will also add don't use super hot water especially if your fish is still cold because sometimes that coldness of the fish like if you've had it on ice uh, or it's recently thawed and the super hot water can cause the jars to crack so Lukewarm is fine, um, but it's better to slowly bring the heat up as we get going here. So I will also add a splash of either lemon juice or vinegar to the canner. This just helps keep that fishy smell down and it also makes it a lot easier to clean it. I'm canning indoors today because uh, it's like 50 mile an hour winds outside and it would just blow out the propane. So uh, if, especially if you're canning indoors, um, when the jars break, you're going to get a lot of fishy smell. You put the lemon juice or vinegar in there, that'll take care of that issue. Then we're just gonna line up the lid so it locks into place and make it nice and firm. And we've got our pressure gauge. And then I'm gonna put the heat on medium until we start to get steam rising from this little spout right here. I wanna slowly heat this up. I don't wanna just crank the heat on it because it can cause those jars to break the meat is still pretty cold so i slowly want to heat everything up all right so this has been venting for a couple minutes so i'm going to go ahead and add a 10 pound weight and then we're going to keep an eye on this and once this gets up to 10 pounds we're going to start the timer for 100 minutes now the first thing that will indicate that you have a good seal on your canner is this little thing's going to pop up right here so right now i got steam coming through there once the pressure builds enough it should pop up and then we'll start to see pressure build on the gauge here. There we go. Okay, now that it's up to 10 pounds, I'm gonna go ahead and put on a timer for 100 minutes. And then as this goes up above 10, this 10 pound weight's gonna start to shimmy back and forth and release that excess pressure to keep it close to 10. So you can dial it back a little bit so that this doesn't get up there, but it'll start rocking back and forth as it wants to relieve the pressure. So I'll go ahead and dial back the heat just a little bit. But basically, you don't want this thing to be pushing out a ton of steam. You're just trying to keep this closer to 10 pounds. It's okay if it's a little bit over. You'll see it starting to move back and forth now. So I'll go ahead and turn down the heat and just try and keep this right around 10 to 12 without losing a ton of steam right here off of the pressure valve. All right, it's been going for 100 minutes. Now what I want to do is turn off the heat, but you want to leave the weight on there and let this come back down to zero on the pressure gauge on its own. And when this little tab drops and the pressure is released entirely from here, then we can open it up. But we don't want to 
decompress quickly because that can actually lead to the jars cracking. So I'm just going to turn off the heat. This can take oftentimes 10, 20 minutes depending on the ambient temperature where you're at. So just have patience and you'll see the pressure is already starting to decline uh, after I turned off the heat. Okay, so the little pressure tab has dropped so we can go ahead and take off the weight. So there should be no pressure in here so we can just remove this. Now be really careful because there's gonna be a super hot steam in here. It's gonna vent out and you can burn yourself really, really easy like I almost did there. Um, so you kinda wanna let the heat escape from there by just pulling it upward. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, I can't do that with the phone in my hand, so give me a sec. Okay, so there's the jars. Um, they are extremely hot. They would still be boiling inside of them because they're under pressure. So I have this little specialized tool that helps me grab the jars and pull them out. So you can see it's still, still boiling inside there. And hopefully you see this little indentation that's popped up. There's a little button there. It kind of flexes upward. As that boils out, it should, uh, the pressure should cause it to seal and that tab will pop down. We should hear a loud pop when it starts to seal. Sometimes it takes a while. So far it doesn't look like any jars broke, which is good. Oh, I just heard one pop. Did you hear that? That's a that's the sound that's music to my ears. So that's the first jar I pulled out has now popped. The indentation is flat. The other ones are still, oh, there goes another one in the back. So we're just gonna let these cool before we handle them. And then in a few days time, I'm gonna see if I can trick Sidra. Thinking that this might be tuna. We'll make a white fish melt sandwich and see if we can pass it off as tuna. There goes another one just sealed. Okay, so there's our jar. I'm gonna pop that open. There we go. Now it's a lot more watery. Got a lot of oils there on top. Okay, so there it is. It's, it's a little bit softer than albacore. Good color though. It does have kind of a tuna-esque smell. I'm gonna try a little bit. It's definitely stronger like taste than canned salmon. It's got a little bit of like a tuna-esque finish. I think it might pass. But you can definitely tell it's not albacore. It doesn't have that firmer texture of, of tuna. Let's see what happens when we add all the ingredients. I usually do garlic powder, black pepper, real mayo. I dice up some pickles, give it some tang. And then I also throw some Dijon mustard in there. And then I'm going to put on a couple slices of rye and a sharp, a big thick slice of sharp cheddar. And then I'm going to just toast it in the oven so I can do it at low temperature and really get that cheese soften up. Okay. What? So it does taste different. From tuna. What is it? It's white fish. Oh, it's fishy. It's fishier than tuna, huh? Mm hmm I thought it was from the store. What? So it's not faux tuna. It doesn't pass as tuna. Not quite. <laughs> All right, so Sidra says not quite like tuna. It tastes like cheap tuna. So white fish tastes like cheap tuna. So if you can your own albacore at home, you'll be disappointed, but if you eat cheap tuna, then whitefish is probably okay.